The jury in the trial of Umar Zamir is now deliberating. The move comes after hours of instruction from the judge and weeks of testimony. Zamir is facing a first degree murder charge in the death of Constable Jeffrey Northrup. Good evening. We will get the latest from court in just a moment. But first, one man is dead after a stabbing in Etobicoke early this afternoon. Police say a man was found dead in a home near Kipling and Eglinton. CTV's Beth McDonnell is live at the scene tonight with the latest. Beth. Nathan, Toronto police were called here around 2 in the afternoon over the reports of a stabbing. Officers appear to be focusing their investigation at the house behind me. It's grey and black. The violence broke out inside a home near Princess Anne Court and Bournemouth Road. This is in the Kipling and Eglinton area. I can tell you one man is dead and another man is in custody. There is a lot of police activity on this residential street. P police are working in in the back of the black and gray house where there is an orange tarp. The homicide unit is investigating and police say there is no threat to public safety. Now, just a short time ago, I did connect with police. They say a detective is en route to give reporters more information and we will share those details as they become available. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Michelle, Nathan, back to you. Thank you, Beth. After weeks of testimony, jurors in the trial of Umar Zamir have now begun their deliberations. After a detailed charge from the justice overseeing the trial, jurors went out late this afternoon. And CTV's John Woodward has been following the trial, and he joins us live outside the courthouse with the very latest. John. Michelle, the fate of Umar Zamir is now in the hands of a jury deliberating just steps from the City Hall Parkade where Constable Northrup lost his life. And the final word to them was from a judge who is extremely skeptical of the Crown's case. Good buddy, how are you? One big question for the jury, according to Justice Anne Malloy, whether Umar Zamir knew Detective Constable Jeffrey Northrup was a police officer when he and his partner, Sergeant Lisa Forbes, approached Zamir's BMW in the Toronto. Hall Parkade on Canada Day 2021. Three witness police officers have testified the pair identified themselves by voice and badge, and Zamir took off, running down Northrop head on, a death that was the result of Zamir's own choices. Zamir and his wife testified they were downtown for Canada Day. They had no idea the people who approached them were police officers and thought they were being robbed. Their two year old son was in the car, his lawyers saying it was a tragic accident. Justice Malloy warned the jury in her charge Thursday that the Crown never put their theory of the case to their own expert witness. She said there is no evidence that fully supports the Crown's theory. It is clear from the video that Officer Northrup was not standing upright in the laneway when he was knocked to the ground and run over, even though the three police witnesses all say that he was. That video and the expert evidence showed the car moved forward, was blocked by an unmarked police van, and then sideswiped Northrop as it reversed, knocking him over into what one expert said was a blind spot, killing Northrop as it accelerated over him. Photos of the BMW did not show any dents consistent with a head-on collision. Malloy said all three officers would have to be wrong about this detail in exactly the same way for this theory to make sense. When three versions of the event are wrong and wrong in the same way, you must also consider whether there has been collusion between those witnesses. Her Honor's uh, particular comment about that portion of the evidence for the Crown is extremely damaging to the Crown's case. And I mean extremely damaging. The jury has four options, first degree murder, second degree murder, manslaughter and a finding of not guilty. As complex as the law is in this case, the, the question really is this, why on earth would um, this man, Mr. Zamir, why would he intentionally run over a police officer? Why would he commit a, a, a homicide, a culpable homicide. Malloy said the jury must decide the facts for themselves, saying it is entirely up to you how you choose to come to your task. I have laid out what I think is a logical approach. The rest, she said, is up to them. The jury started deliberating at about 5.30 this afternoon. Typically, they deliberate late into the evening, so we'll be watching. Reporting live from Toronto Superior Court, I'm John Woodward. Back to you. Thank you, John. And still ahead, the controversy over the kafia at Queen's Park. Politicians from all parties are speaking out after the speaker announced he was banning the scarf from the property. But first, a look at the weather forecast. There's a live shot. Clouds, breezy, but at least it's above seasonal. 
Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Jessica. Bit of a silver lining there. We are still watching kind of two different things going on. We have the system that we were dealing with yesterday that brought all that shower activity. Another one on the way to bring a wave of showers into the day tomorrow. But for now, we are right in the middle, kind of holding on to a bit of a reprieve, just a cloudy sky with a few breaks in that cloud deck. There's not much going on for us here in the GTA. It is not the sunniest, but at least it's dry. Temperature-wise, mild. We're at 18 through Windsor, kind of around the Golden Horseshoe, between about 11 and 12 degrees. Through the island, over towards Pearson, kind of between 11 and 12. Again, the west-northwesterly wind is fairly moderate, so it's decent for spending some time outside. Coming up, a full look at your long-range forecast. We'll time out that rain tomorrow, but right now, I'll send things back over to Nathan. Thank you, Jess. More road closures to tell you about coming up why the DVP will be closed to anyone heading downtown overnight and why King Street will soon see months of lane closures. More than 120 victims losing hundreds of thousands of dollars and tonight police say they have pulled the plug on what's known as the emergency grandparent scam. Several of the victims were targeted on several occasions. Police saying they believe other victims may be too embarrassed to come forward. CTV's Janice Golding is live tonight with all the details. Janice. Hi, Nathan. Yes, investigators from 11 police services across Ontario and Quebec have laid 56 charges against 14 people in relation to a multi-year investigation they first launched in September 2022. You're watching two suspects accused of scamming seniors being taken into custody. Part of a group of 14 busted in Montreal this week in a joint forces operation called Project Sharp. They would impersonate police officers, judges, lawyers, and loved ones, preying on grandparents who believed they were trying to help family, family members in trouble. Since February 2022, OPP say they believe this group exploited vulnerable Canadians, largely seniors with landlines, and a sophisticated emergency grandparent scam. And I would do anything to help my grandchildren. London's Mabel Baharal was almost a victim herself. Just a few days ago, the 84-year-old told CTV News she got a call saying her 18-year-old grandson was in trouble. I need $8,000 to get out of jail. Baharal immediately reached out to her son and would learn Mitchell was safe at home. That it is crucial to resist with the pressure to act quickly when receiving a call or a message asking for money or personal information and to take the time to verify. Baharal was one of the lucky ones. Between January and April this year, Project Sharp identified 126 people who'd been defrauded of $739,000. 15 of the victims scammed multiple times to the tune of 243,000. When a criminal impersonates a loved one or an authority figure with violent messaging and manipulation, victims face a sense of betrayal and trauma. Their sense of trust is shattered, which is often a contributing factor for frauds being underreported. The shame associated with being taken in is so bad, police say they believe only 5 to 10 percent of these crimes are actually reported. I got so sick, I couldn't even get out of bed. Beharrell didn't even lose any money, but being preyed on still hit her hard. Because the crime is so underreported, police believe this group has actually built Canadians of about $2.2 million. And so they are urging anyone who's had similar experiences to come forward. At this point, they say they recovered, they have recovered more than half of the stolen cash. Reporting live, Janice Golding, got back to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Janice. Toronto will carry on with its vacant home tax, despite the chaos it caused this year. Today, council voted to revamp the program in time for next year. CTV's Natalie Johnson is live tonight at City Hall with the latest. Natalie. Well, Michelle City staff were grilled here in the chamber today about what went wrong with this year's vacant home tax rollout and how this kind of debacle can be averted moving forward. Councillors ultimately deciding to carry on with the tax, but with a promise to Torontonians that next year will be better. Toronto's vacant home tax will live to see another year. We need to fix this. With City Council voting today to keep the controversial program that saw more than 100,000 Torontonians receive big bills for money they didn't actually owe. I inherited a deeply flawed design of a program. It was deeply flawed in terms of its communication and I'm cleaning up the mess. Mayor Olivia Chow pushed to maintain the tax. This is, we just hammered these people with these bills. In the face of an effort by some councillors to cancel it completely. The core policy 
is a reverse onus on citizens to prove to the government that they simply live in their homes. But in the end, only five councillors backed the attempt to wax the tax. And we've seen the problems that it's caused, not only residents of the city, but city staff as well. The huge cost, the inconvenience, the anguish. I just don't think it's worth it. We've spent all this time and resource and energy and money and the stress that we've caused on Torontonians and you have to ask the question is, is the juice worth the squeeze? The tax is designed to discourage speculators from letting homes sit empty during a housing crisis. Today, council endorsed an overhaul of the program, waiving any late fees incurred during the confusion this year and directing staff to come up with a way to do it better moving forward. This after panic over penalties two weeks ago when 167,000 bills went out compared to 11,000 the year before. Who do you blame for this? Well, staff. I, I mean, we we should have been notified that there was an issue. You don't send out tax bills to thousands of people uh, after you realize that there was, there was a problem with the program. The mayor yesterday said the staff member in charge of the program was no longer employed by the city. Today, it was clarified that... Were any staff uh, fired as a result of the rollout? Uh, through the speaker, no. Thank you. A tax that council has now ruled is not too broken to fix. Now, city staff have been directed to report back before next year's budget process with a plan on how to make this all more user-friendly moving forward, especially for vulnerable populations like seniors. That will include a brand new communication strategy. They have also been asked to examine the feasibility of using city utility data to automatically assess whether a home is vacant or occupied to remove the burden from home homeowners as to whether to opt in or out. Separately, just in the last hour here in the chamber, city council has approved the idea of making the Drinking in Parks pilot program permanent moving forward. This will not apply citywide to all parks, but rather to a specific list of approved parks in what the city calls an incremental approach. Reporting live in the chamber, I'm Natalie Johnson, Nathan and Michelle. Back to you. Thank you, Natalie. The province's police watchdog has charged an officer in Peel Region after a crash last summer left a woman with serious injuries. The night of August 28th, the Special Investigations Unit says the officer was driving on Beauvert drive east in Brampton while responding to a call. It's alleged he then drove his marked police SUV into another vehicle at Dixie Road. The driver was taken to hospital. Acting Sergeant Jonathan Kreese now faces a charge of dangerous driving causing bodily harm. Be prepared for more traffic slowdowns downtown. The city says beginning Monday until the following Sunday, the westbound lanes on King between Dufferin and Joe Schuster will be closed while one eastbound lane will remain open. From April 29th until September, full road closures will be in effect around a rolling work zone. And from September until November, there will be intermittent lane closures. The city says the work is being done to renew aging streetcar tracks and replace a 146-year-old water main. We recognize that this is happening at a time when there are a number of other construction projects on the go in the downtown really impacting traffic and particularly the Gardner Lane closures. And I just want to assure everyone that we have a very detailed congestion traffic management plan uh, that is in effect. Uh, we're going to be modifying traffic signal timings to almost 60 traffic signals within the city. And the city says the southbound DVP will be closed tonight beginning at 10 p.m. This closure will occur between Don Mills and Bayview Bloor, the ramp. Southbound traffic will be diverted at Don Mills and northbound traffic will be reduced to a single lane beginning at Pottery Road. Officials warn there will be significant northbound delays. The closure is needed so city staff can remove a damaged messaging sign. The DVP is expected to reopen around 5.30 tomorrow morning. It's a traditional scarf that the Speaker of the Ontario Legislature sees as a political statement, and he says for that reason, he's banned it from Queen's Park. The move has been condemned by the leaders of all four political parties, but at this point has not been reversed. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris is live to explain why. Siobhan. Well, the Speaker explains this is really all about following the rules. You need permission to do all kinds of things, to show support for your hockey team during the playoffs or to pin on a daffodil during Cancer Awareness Month. But those political leaders you mentioned, Michelle, say that this is only going to divide Ontarians. You've probably spotted them more often on the street and in the crowd at pro-Palestinian demonstrations. But at the Ontario legislature, kafias are banned for politicians, staff and visitors. A call made by the speaker who sees them as political symbols. I believe I'm, I'm 
you following you through on the traditions of the House and the established uh, uh, rulings that have been made by many speakers. The decision condemned by the leaders of Ontario's four main political parties. This is cultural attire. This is um, people uh, identifying as a part of a community, their heritage. A scarf of significance to Muslim, Palestinian and Arab communities. The Premier is among those asking the Speaker to reconsider. We see the, the division right now that's going on. It's, it's not healthy, and this would just divide the community uh, even more. An opposition motion for unanimous consent to allow kafias failed. Agreed? No. I heard some no's. One of those voices, a progressive conservative at odds with the Premier. She says rules need to be followed. Otherwise, we politicize the entire debate inside the legislature, and that's not what it's about. We use our words to persuade, not our items of clothing. There are questions about how far this thinking could go. How does it make that different from other re religious symbols or other symbols that people do wear. Ontario has MPPs who wear turbans into the legislative chamber, a kippah and a hijab. The speaker brushes off suggestions he's on a slippery slope that religious symbols might be banished next. I wouldn't see anyone wearing a turban or a hijab at the present time as being a um, political statement. Opposition MPPs say what needs to happen now is the Premier needs to draft a government motion to allow the scarves here at Queen's Park. That's something that couldn't be easily undone by one or two dissenting voices. Reporting live from Queen's Park, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan and Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Some added pain at the pumps for drivers across the region this evening after an overnight increase to the cost of gas. Every day I'm putting 50 bucks a day because I live in Oakville. Yeah. 50 bucks a day to come from there all the way to the city. So it's just like, it's like 250 bucks a week just to get to work. It makes going to work more expensive. So it feels like my dollars that I'm earning at work don't go as far because I'm spending a lot of money going there and back every day. The price for a liter of regular jumped around 14 cents at midnight to nearly $1.80. There were long waits at gas stations as motorists tried to fill up before the pump switched over to the more expensive summer blend of fuel. We don't normally see jumps like this. We saw one in 2022. Back to 2008, last time we saw a 14 cent one fell, cent, uh, one fell swoop increase. But it has a lot to do uh, with the cost of what's in that summer spec gasoline and the cost is getting much higher. Dan McTagg says those components include chemicals that make gas less volatile during hotter weather. For his part, Premier Doug Ford accused oil and gas companies of gouging Canadians. So what I did, I, I called up my friends in the U.S in the same climate, because they, they use this excuse up here, these oil companies, that in my opinion are gouging the people. I call them up and I ask them, you know, in Chicago and Minnesota, because it's roughly the same climate, what's your gas price? Is it going up? They said no. While Premier Ford pointed to examples of cheaper prices south of the border, seasonal gas rules exist there as well. Fuel saving site Gas Buddy says different regions have undergone the switch at different times. The premier said the federal tax on carbon was also a factor. On Parliament Hill today, the Conservatives called on the federal government to pause the carbon tax after gas prices spiked. You might need a nugget of gold to buy gas in Ontario today. After nine years of this prime minister, his carbon tax prices have hiked the cost of gas by 14 cents a litre today. If, you refuse to call, if he refuses to call a carbon tax election, will the prime minister put a pause on his punishing hikes over the summer so that Canadians can take a little road trip? Or will he do everyone in this country a favour and take a permanent road trip so the Canadians can afford to live? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Eight out of ten, eight out of ten families receive more in the carbon rebate than they pay on the carbon price. The reason is that all the proceeds from the carbon price are sent back to Canadians. Wealthier families pay more, pay more, so low-income and middle-class families get more, Mr. Speaker. The Conservatives insist the carbon tax makes life less affordable for Canadians. Senior U.S. officials met virtually with their Israeli counterparts, expressing concern about a planned ground offensive in Rafah. Washington urged Israel not to launch a large-scale assault on the southern city to avoid more Palestinian civilian casualties. The U.S. is seeking alternatives to the offensive. Today, the Israelis agreed to take those concerns into account. The rising tensions with Iran was also discussed. 
At the United Nations, the U.S. has vetoed a draft resolution that recommended the Palestinian Authority become a full member. We do uh, not believe that the uh, pathway through New York and the United Nations is the best path forward. And as I so noted, uh, such action through the United Nations would statutorily require the United States to cease its funding to the U.N. That's certainly not something uh, we're interested in doing either. The Security Council has long endorsed two states living side by side within secure and recognized borders. But the U.S. says an independent Palestinian state should be established through direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. A Polish man has been arrested in connection with an alleged plot to assassinate Ukraine's president. Volodymyr Zelensky has gained the respect and admiration of his people and allies around the world for his leadership during the war. Today, Poland's national prosecutor said the suspect is accused of being prepared to pass airport security information to Russian agents. The airport in southeastern Poland is a primary hub for international supplies going to Ukraine. It also serves leaders and politicians traveling there. In Italy, the head of NATO urged a gathering of G7 foreign ministers to ramp up support for Ukraine. The urgent need now is air defense and artillery uh, rounds. Uh, but in the more longer term, we need a more uh, institutionalized, a more stable, robust framework around our support so we can organize and coordinate it better and also that we can have multi-year uh, commitments uh, to ensure that the Ukrainians can plan and to ensure that they have the necessary capabilities uh, when they need them. The ministers of the leading industrialized nations were also told that quick, concrete steps are needed and that continued delays could tilt the war in Russia's favor. That message was also delivered by the European foreign policy chief who addressed the conference. Prince William returned to public duties today for the first time since his wife's cancer diagnosis. The prince visited a surplus food distribution center in Surrey. He lent a hand in the kitchen. At one point, receiving Get Well cards for Kate and his father, who's also undergoing treatment for cancer. William later helped deliver meals to a youth center in West London. The Princess of Wales will return to public duties when her medical team says she's well enough to do so. In Massachusetts, a child is safe after briefly getting stuck on the top of a chimney. The boy climbed out of a second floor window and got onto the roof of a home in the town of Whitman. The 10 year old then maneuvered himself into the top of the chimney and got stuck. The fire department responded and were able to quickly free the boy. He was not injured. It's been erupting for months now, but a different look at that volcano in southwestern Iceland is what we're going to show you. This is time lapse video of the northern lights overhead as the volcano erupts. It's blown its stack four times since December, sending lava towards a nearby community. But the activity is slowly diminishing. The current eruption has been going on for 28 days and has officially become the second longest of the seven that have occurred in the last three years. NASA has confirmed details of a new mission that will see a drone go to Saturn's largest moon looking for signs of life. They were sort of saying goodbye to the little flying robot for, uh, that did so well on Mars and wanted to be able to be clear that this was going to have a legacy. And so now they have made very clear that they are all in for a July 2028 launch. The original Dragonfly mission ran into numerous setbacks. Financial restrictions, design refinements, and the effects of the pandemic forced strategy changes. The finished drone, about the size of a small car, will cost more than $3 billion, which is about twice as much as expected. Visitors to the UK's largest zoo are enjoying the antics of one of its young residents. A baby white rhino has been enjoying the spring sunshine at the zoo. Staff shared video of the 100 kilogram endangered animal running and jumping around its paddock. The six week old calf only started venturing outside its den in recent days with its mother. The little tank has been named Benja by con conservationists in Kenya. They chose the name in honor of a black rhino bull that lives in the conservation area where the charity is based. From an adorable rhino to a missing feline found coming up an airport ordeal that saw a beloved cat named Kevin disappear and reappear on the runway at Pearson. 
And I'm Pat Florin. Coming up on Consumer Alert, are you looking for a job? If you're searching on social media, don't get scammed. A Toronto woman thought she was hired to work with a major department store, but she was scammed out of $15,000. I'll have my reports. That's just ahead. And we are well into the swing of the spring season. It also means allergy season for so many levels are high or moderately high, almost completely across the board. So just prepare accordingly when you go outside. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your language forecast, give you a preview of your Friday and then the rest of the weekend. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. If you're looking for a job, you may see postings on social media advertising positions that are available. While legitimate companies do use online platforms to post jobs, scammers are also online trying to steal your money. Here's Pat Foran with tonight's Consumer Alert. Pat. The are Michelle and Nathan. Thank you. A woman who recently moved to Canada was searching online and thought she found the perfect job that would allow her to work from home. She was told to buy products using her own money and was eventually scammed out of $15,000. I recently moved to Canada back in November 2022. When Devanshi Podar moved to Toronto from India, she needed work. And last year, while searching online, she saw a job posting on Instagram. There was this ad stating Walmart is looking for part-time employees and you can work from home. Recognizing Walmart, she assumed the employment posting was legitimate. She applied and was hired. She was told the job involved promoting Walmart products online. We just had to go there and add these products to a cart and send them a screenshot that this is done. Over time, she was told to use her own money to buy expensive products and that she would be reimbursed. Well, it appeared her money was being given back to her in a separate account. It never was, and she was scammed out of $15,000. Being a new country, you know, you have questions in mind, but also you want to trust the process. CTV News reached out to Walmart and a spokesperson said, Walmart Canada's recruitment ads on social media linked to our career site. We also want to make it clear we would never ask anyone for money to apply for a job. There's many people who are being scammed as a result of looking for opportunities online. Technology experts say complicating matters is that some companies are using social media platforms to find employees, meaning applicants have to be extremely careful they don't get caught in a scam. The immediate red flag would be the amount of money that's required in order to join or be a part of any job up front. Signs of a job scam, you're asked to send money in advance. You're told to cover purchases with your funds. You're asked to provide your bank details up front. There is no in-person or video interview, and the job involves easy, mundane tasks. Podar says for her, losing $15,000 was devastating. 15000 is not a small amount. It was all my savings. I didn't know what to do. There were days when I was, I was, I used to just sit and cry. And according to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, the job scam is now the fourth most popular scam in Canada. Canadians looking for work last year lost more than $27 million to employment scams. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. And just like that, it's Thursday night already. And if you have plans to head outdoors, it is mild, not much in the way of sunshine, but it, we're through with the rain for now. Yeah, that's pretty good. It does look like rain's coming, but that's not the case. It, it's yeah. on our doorstep. So we're kind of bookended. We have, we're in the middle, drawing you guys a picture, and then you have <laughs> rain on either side. So we're in this little bit of a triangle right now. So just keep that in mind that we are done for now. But as we head into the start of the day tomorrow, just in time for that commute, we're going to have some rain. So this is your heads up now to give yourself some extra time. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. It's been a soggy week, right? We, we're not so bad to start things off. And then we've seen this rain kind of sitting with us for the past few days. But at least we're still holding on around seasonal. So in 18 through Windsor, 11 here in the city through northern Ontario, kind of comfortably between about 7 and 12 degrees. A little cooler up towards Piawanek, but that is to be expected.
Tonight, we're pretty close to seasonal, sitting around six, the norm is four, so we're in a more comfortable range when it comes to sleeping. If you don't have AC going on right now, we're at seven through Hamilton, they should be at two. Peterborough should be at one and they'll be sitting at five. Into the day tomorrow, again, we're pretty close to seasonal, just above, and we're sitting at about 15. Those showers are just in time for that morning drive tomorrow. We'll kind of get rid of them by lunch and then we have a pretty decent second half of the day. There's that triangle I was talking about. There's the one side of it, we're smack dab in the middle, and the other side of the triangle. So as we head in towards the day tomorrow, that comes just in time for a lot of our drives to work or to school. So just again, plan accordingly if you can, have the rain gear if you're gonna be waiting for the bus and just give yourself time on the roads. Uh, tonight, it's not too bad, comfortable if you wanna get out for a walk this evening. It's as we get into the start of the day tomorrow, this last band of showers bringing some thunderstorms to start the day through London and Owen Sound. For us, we're looking at more in the way of those heavier showers late morning through about 10 a.m. But for us, it really starts around 7.30 through to the lunch hour and then into the afternoon, it pushes out, the sunshine comes in. So the second half of our Friday, really, really beautiful. Into Saturday, a little cloud cover does start to make its way back in and we're watching for maybe a light scattered shower to mark the middle of the day, but nothing compared to what we had yesterday yesterday. So we're not completely done with it just yet, but that's just the tail end of that system. Temperature wise, still super nice. 15 degrees as we head into the day tomorrow, even with that little bit of rain likely to make its way into the first half of our day on Saturday. We're looking at still a really beautiful day, around 10 for the high, 2 for the low, so fairly seasonal once again. Sunday, chef's kiss, a beautiful end to the weekend, 13 degrees, a whole lot of sunshine out there, and we hold on to that for Monday as well. The chance of a passing shower on Tuesday, but overall as we kind of tiptoe in towards the you know end of April, those April showers are doing us some favors. Nathan, I'll send things back over to you. All right, thank you, Jess. Thanks. Also tonight, how long does COVID immunity last after booster shots? New insight from researchers at York University. A new Canadian study looks at how long COVID immunity lasts after booster shots. And as our health reporter Pauline Chan tells us, the news is positive. David Dick and a team of mathematical researchers at York University have been studying how long immunity lasts after COVID-19 vaccinations. We were looking at the durability of immunity comparing the primary series, so the first two doses of COVID vaccines with the booster dose. And they looked at both the Moderna vaccine as well as Pfizer. What we did find is that the booster doses had longer lasting immunity than the primary series alone, uh, which is really positive that the additional dose lasted even longer than the original two doses. The study found that for the first set of two vaccine doses, immunity was reduced by half after 63 days. But with the COVID boosters, the half-life was much longer, 115 days, almost twice as long. The primary series half-life is tighter and also um, quite a bit shorter than the booster series. The data comes from two groups of people, residents of long-term care facilities and healthcare workers. And while age is usually associated with a less robust immune system, the researchers found that coexisting illnesses such as obesity, diabetes, smoking and cancer were even more significant. We found that the comorbidities were actually more important to describe how long your immunity would last than your age itself, which is really interesting. Um, we found some counterintuitive results, like people with asthma actually had more durable immune responses. Dick says as mathematicians, they're not able to give health recommendations for the dosage of boosters, but he hopes that their information can reassure people about the immunity given by booster shots and help doctors determine who needs more attention in deciding the frequency of COVID boosters. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Those findings come as health officials recommend a COVID-19 booster shot this spring for anyone at increased risk of severe illness. That means Ontarians aged 65 and up or 55 and up for First Nations, Inuit or Métis. It also includes residents of long-term care homes and other types of congregate living for seniors. Those considered moderately to severely immunocompromised are advised to get a booster as well if it's been six months since their last shot or confirmed infection. If you're not considered high risk, officials say they don't recommend an additional dose right now. If your workday is starting to feel a little too repetitive, new research suggests your brain health could suffer in the future. Norwegian researchers found having a routine job with little mental stimulation in your 30s through to your 60s was linked to a 66% higher risk of mild cognitive impairment and a 37% greater risk of dementia after the age of 70. That was compared to a job described as having high cognitive and interpersonal demands. The findings were published yesterday in the journal Neurology. 
Fans are counting down to Taylor Swift's latest album release, despite reports of potential leaks, and the singer is sharing details about the lead single. While Swifties search for hints in all the content she shares, Swift confirmed that a track titled Fortnite featuring Post Malone will have its music video debut tomorrow night. In the meantime, the tortured poets department drops at midnight, and Spotify says it set a record for most pre-save countdown page ahead of its release. After the break, Netflix nets millions of new subscribers as the streaming giant far surpasses analysts' expectations. What's at play in moments? Gearing up for game one. The Leafs are heading to the playoffs, and we've got you covered to get you into the spirit. CP24 Breakfast, where Toronto gets its everything every morning. The question really is this. Why on earth would... Um, this man, Mr. Zamir, why would he intentionally run over a police officer? Why would he commit a, a, a homicide, a culpable homicide? Updating our top stories, the jury in the trial of Umar Zamir is now deliberating. Their task will be to determine if he is criminally responsible for the death of Toronto Police Constable Jeffrey Northrup. They would impersonate police officers, judges, lawyers, and loved ones preying on grandparents who believed they were trying to help family, family members in trouble. Police announced a series of arrests after breaking up an emergency grandparent scam that victimized more than 120 people who police say lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. We spent all this time and resource and energy and money and the stress that we've caused on Torontonians and you have to ask the question, is, is the juice worth the squeeze? And Toronto's highly controversial vacant home tax will live on despite an error that saw more than 100,000 Torontonians receive big bills for money they didn't actually owe. And remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. In business today, the word is stagflation, and it sent stocks sliding. With more, here's Andrew Bell from BNN Bloomberg. Hello there. U.S. stocks came under pressure today, although Toronto is slightly higher, with investors selling sectors seen as vulnerable to inflation, including real estate. Meanwhile, Bloomberg says investors are now worried that the robust U.S. economy is finally headed for slower growth. A weak economy beset with inflation is said to be suffering from stagflation. Markets have dropped in April. However, U.S. stocks are still up around 5% this year, while Toronto is ahead just under 4%. Mining investors were happy today as the red metal, copper, topped $4.42 U.S. a pound, the highest in two years. China, the world's biggest user of copper, is struggling with slow growth, and electric vehicle sales have flagged. They use vast amounts of copper. However, threats have emerged to global supply of the metal, with mine output weak, and some market players have gone short or bet against copper, and that raises this prospect of a short squeeze that could send prices sharply higher. And finally, shares in NVIDIA, the chip maker seen as a major player in computing for artificial intelligence, have dropped 10% from their March peak. But the stock rose a little today on comments from TSMC, the world's biggest maker of advanced chips. TSMC expects a doubling of AI server processor sales this year. City analyst Atif Malik said, quote, AI, AI demand remains extremely high. Let's have a look now at the markets. The Canadian dollar was at 72.64 US cents, up a fraction. WTI oil, the North American benchmark, changed hands at $82.10, down 5 cents. Western Canadian Select Oil was at $69.17, down $3.03. And the TSX Composite ended at 21,708.44, up just over 52 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNM Bloomberg. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. 
Investors are keeping an eye on Netflix stock after it reported some mixed results in the first three months of the year. The streaming service smashed Wall Street estimates of around 5 million new subscribers for the quarter, instead reporting 9.3 million new customers. Netflix attributed that jump in part to its cheaper ad-supported plans, which it says make up 40 percent of signups where available. At the same time, revenue growth is expected to be slightly below analyst expectations for the current quarter. A senior living residence's operator with several locations in Ontario and B.C. could be up for sale. Sources tell Bloomberg the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan is exploring a potential deal to sell Amica senior lifestyles. The residences and business could be valued at around $5 billion, according to people familiar with the talks. Representatives for Amica and the pension plan didn't comment on Bloomberg's report. Recent surveys suggest an ongoing shift in online retail trends, especially when it comes to younger Canadians. Fintech company Aiden polled 2,000 Canadians and 500 businesses in January. 37% of consumers had used social media to purchase a product over the last year. Those percentages included 61% of Gen Z, slightly less than half of millennials, one in three Gen X, and 16% of baby boomers. If you don't have enough social media apps to keep track of, TikTok is now rolling out its competitor to Instagram as platforms try to get users posting and sharing different types of content. An app called TikTok Notes is being tested here in Canada and in Australia. It will let users post photos and text like Instagram's main app. Instagram has rolled out its own tools to compete with other companies, including Reels intended to take on TikTok. Meanwhile, another social media app, Snapchat, is adding more protections around content that's generated with the help of artificial intelligence. The company says it already indicates when users are interacting with a feature powered by AI and watches for misleading political content using the technology. Now, Snapchat says it will add a special watermark to images generated using AI on its platform so people are informed about their origins. The province is promising cash to help build or rebuild sports and recreation facilities across Ontario. We want to ensure that new and upgraded facilities remain the heart of communities across the province for decades to come. The Ford government says it will provide up to $200 million over three years that will be split into two streams, repairing or upgrading existing facilities to help them better suit community needs and building new facilities in areas where existing sites are at the end of their lifespan. Organizers of the Paris Olympics are promising quite a show when the world tunes in for the opening ceremony in July. The spectacle along the River Sienne is going to last nearly four hours. 80 boats will be carrying over 200 delegations. About 320,000 spectators will line the shore along the six-kilometer route. Once the more than 10,000 athletes have disembarked from their vessels, the final part of the ceremony takes place at the plaza overlooking the Eiffel Tower. Just ahead, a beloved pet missing at Pearson Airport found on the runway. Kevin the cat reunited with family after an unexpected air travel ordeal. Tonight, a tailor-made secret out too soon. I said I only listened to one song. I'm so sorry. I've listened to you. I've listened to you. Another Swifty meltdown after an alleged leak of the superstar's new album. Later on CTV National News. And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And a special what's up to those of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010. Get Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. Finally tonight, Kevin the Cat is now home after an adventure-filled few days. After a flight from Scotland, Kevin went missing, only to be found wandering the runways at Pearson Airport. CTV's Mike Walker has the story. <laughs> Kevin the cat may appear timid, but this feline has endured a harrowing 72 hours after he went missing at Pearson Airport. It's been really, really stressful. And to be honest, I didn't anticipate a happy ending. Jackie Winterfield says the British short hair belongs to her daughter, Emily, who was living abroad. Emily and Kevin arrived on an air transit flight from Glasgow, Scotland on Sunday. They discovered Kevin was missing when they went looking for his crate in the baggage claim area. They brought out his carrier empty with the gate pushed in. They spent two days scouring the airport. Then shortly after midnight Wednesday, they received a phone call from the airport that Kevin had been discovered on the runway. 
How on earth did this cat get out? How on earth did this cat survive? Reunited, Kevin was hungry and covered in soot. Winterfield said the issue actually started prior to boarding in Scotland. Her daughter had paid for Kevin to ride in the cabin and even bought him a special soft-sided carrier. They said he couldn't come in the cabin with her, that they had an issue with the soft-sided carrier, and so they said that he would have to be treated as cargo. An Air Transat spokesperson says the airline takes the care and safety of all transported pets very seriously, and we deeply sympathize with the distress this has caused Kevin's owner, adding our team did everything possible to locate Kevin once we were notified of his escape. I feel frustrated with Air Transat. Uh, I, you know, you... You have no choice but to trust them with the transport of your cat. And then at the end of the day, they don't. Winterfield is considering legal action to help recoup extra costs. But for now, the family is relieved Kevin the cat is back home. We're relieved that he seems to be in, in good health. Mike Walker, CTV News, Whippy. Kevin thought the runway was the catwalk. Yeah. Uh, he looks like he's seen some things. <laughs> I love that. Listen, that's a good looking cat. He was like, you know, I'm just going to take a little bit of a stroll. It was it rainy this week. Not, not the greatest cat. day. I know. Good for him, though, for like coming through. Like, shout out to Kevin. But uh, it's going to be much nicer. Hopefully, he's not back outside as we head in towards at least the end of the week. A little more rain on the way tomorrow morning, went into the afternoon. Nice. For now, it is still relatively mild out there, sitting around 11 through the Golden Horseshoe. If you're going out for a walk to Nice, so pretty comfortable. A northwesterly wind will make it feel just a little fresh out there, but overall, a beautiful end to the day. Again, that shower activity just in time for the commute tomorrow and then some late day sun. All right, thank you, Jess. Be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Alban with her next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night.